Okay, so I remembered to start recording this time. I'm gonna go ahead and start, get started. Um, well, yeah, it was 11, okay. Um, so any questions anybody wants to start off with here or online? Um, so yeah, as usual, you know, I'm gonna try and leave a little bit of time in case people are working on getting their dev box set up. It'd be a good idea that you get them set up today. I might ask people to, I don't know, email me your status sometime by the end of the week. You know, either you got your dev box up and running or where you're at and what issue you need. So I really need to, if you don't have it up by now, I need to probably look at you, you know, one-on-one -on -one or something, either over Zoom or, or here today or whatever, and try and get you set up. I do have alternatives in case, I mean, occasionally somebody have some, so much technical problems um, that um, their own hardware is just not going to work. So I've got some other options. Hopefully we can avoid that. It's nice to have it on your own system. So uh, like I said uh, in the previous session, I mean, I'm, I'm really not going to do kind of traditional lectures on these. Um, so today I thought I'd go over the first assignment some more, see if anybody had questions on that. I have one or two things I can say. We'll see if anybody had any questions. That they wanted to ask me on that and then uh the, the first written problem set which is due friday again as a reminder i should remember not to move out of the camera here too um so you have a problem set due tomorrow um i do have the due dates by five i don't know if i mentioned that um before um because i, I don't like to encourage people to work on friday nights past midnight um let me see if i if i'm remembering that right Uh, yeah, so by, by 5, oh, five it should be 5 p.m. There we go. So um, I, I was planning on doing these by 5. I encourage you to, to get them done instead of, you know, staying up all night doing these things. Same for the programming assignments, all right? I'm probably gonna, I mean, I, I probably won't start grading them, but um, I probably will spot check them. So anybody, you know, that hasn't turned in something by five, I might send you an email reminder um, and I might at least spot check to make certain it look like you turned in something reasonable. You know, you didn't turn in the wrong assignment or something like that. But but um, I probably will be posting like an example solution um, Friday afternoon or Saturday morning and grading them usually within 24 hours or so is my plan for those in the assignment. So, so you do need to get them in by that duty. Um, um, so we did talk a little bit about the assignment last time. Um, uh, yeah, sure. Confusion on what? The jumps, sure. Let's talk about the jumps. So those are the uh, th those we're not given examples of in the textbook. Um, so the 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 uh, I gave a couple of them, and I know that some of the problems, uh, probably three of the four, maybe have jumps in them, or at least two or so. Um, so the the absolute jump is the easiest to understand. So let's say. Um, um, let me avoid, uh, let me bring up, um, you know, just write this out to a document or something. So, or, or uh, maybe not, maybe better yet. Um, Let me actually bring up the spreadsheet here, version of this. So the jumps were, um, well, I mean, you know, the first thing you do have to do some convert. I didn't give them directly to you. You have to convert these binaries to a hexadecimal digit. I did discuss this last time. So, you know, the, the first hexadecimal digit that you see in these problems is going to be the first four bits. Um, and that's going to correspond to one of these uh, jump instructions. So I guess I'll give you one. So, so yeah, I mean, like the, the absolute jump is a, a what? A two to the 
one plus two is a two, so it's four plus two, uh, so it's a six, right? If I got that right, um, for the absolute jump. So anytime you see a six something, it's absolute jump to a particular location. So, um, so let me just make up one here. So for example, if we have a 6302, um, assuming that I had the, uh, the decoding right for the uh, jump instruction, um, that's telling us to jump. And then the last 12 bits, according to our hypothetical machine format, um, give an address where you're gonna do the absolute jump to, right? So, um, so when we fetch this, um, you know, we're gonna end up with just, um, 6302 in there. So normally we'd, we would increment the PC. So, so the normal thing on the execute stage is to actually execute the instruction. And also we do sequential um, uh, execution of instruction. So that means that we uh, increment the PC so that the next fetch execute cycle occurs from the next one normally. But so, so jump instructions, our, our textbook in chapter one talked a little bit about Kind of different categories so there, there's you know one category of instructions are things that just do actual data manipulations or, or work so you know those are your multiplies and your your arithmetic and, and your logic operations are examples of those jump in instructions um, are examples of uh, of flow control instructions so they, they change the the control the, 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 they change uh, how the program executes, right? And th those are the, the instructions that we use at a low level to implement things like loops um, in higher level languages, um, Python or C or whatever, right? So anyway, um, you know, it, it's, it's not too mysterious. So if you're executing a jump, you know, the, the last 12 bits represent an instruction. So instead of doing something with the accumulator, a flow control instruction, instruction is going to manipulate the program counter. So like an absolute jump would be, just writing um, a value into the program counter, right? So the effect of that is, is that now in this, this case, since we jumped to 302, we normally would have been executing 301, fetching and executing 301 on the next instruction, but we did a jump here. Um, so our program counter is gonna be you know, 302 um, and we'll be fetching that instruction uh, you know, so, so we jumping over 301 and, and executing from 302 from that point on. So, so that, that's the basics of jump. So, and um, so there's a variation, of course, in order to implement things like uh, if statements or conditional statements in a high level language, you have to have some way to do like a conditional jump. So most machine languages are going to have conditional jumps or conditional branches of some kind. So it's like jump if the last result was zero or jump if the last result was negative or pretty common, there's other, other kind of conditions or tests that you can do uh, to jump on, right? So for these, um, oops, so, um, let me tabs open. Um, Okay, so like the, I think the seven, so, so don't hold me to this. I'm not going to scroll back up, but um, the seven, if that was like a jump on zero, um, going to be testing the accumulator. So in this case, if the accumulator was zero and we had a jump on zero, we would do the same thing I just showed. We would do the jump. But if we fetched a conditional jump on zero, and then here, um, when we when we test before we do the branch, um, the accumulator is not zero, so we wouldn't perform the jump. So that would be where the conditional occurs. So in that case, we wouldn't change the program counter. We would just do the normal increment. So so we wouldn't actually do a jump in that case. 
um, um, we would just do a sequential execution and our next fetch execute stage would continue on from 301, uh, fetching from 301 and executing. All right. Can speak up? Because, because it was non-zero. So, so like a, a, uh, I think the, the instruction is uh, jump to address if result was zero. So basically if accumulator is zero, then the jump is done. If the accumulator is not zero, then nothing happens. Just the normal sequence, the normal increment of the program counter, the normal sequential execution. So, yeah. All right. Good question. Everybody clear on, on the jumps? Those are probably the most difficult ones that, that I kind of added, but I thought they're important because the, the textbook only had examples of, of uh, what's it called? Uh, our textbook call, again, it calls these like data, you know, manipulation instructions or something like that. Um, this category for uh, subtract and add. So, uh, and then another category of instructions, according to our textbook, are things for moving things in and out of memory. So that's your loads in the store. So, so our example in the textbook had um, some examples of loads and stores, and, and we have some loads and stores, and, and also some subtracts and adds. Um, or actually, I, I probably added subtract. I probably in, put in a subtract. I think it only had an add in our textbook examples. Um, and then these control flow statements, so some jump statements. Um, one other thing I, th I thought I would mention, um, so I usually do kind of explicitly say this when I have students doing this assignment. So also pay attention to the, um, you know, the, 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 the format for values in here, okay? So um, you will get some results that are negative Right, and and I mentioned last time that um, I mean all these values are actually hexadecimal, so you know probably when I do this assignment again, I should put some in here that makes it clear that we have that these are hexadecimal by having some values in here that have A B C Ds in there, right? But the the the, the basic thing is that um, um, there are, are some problems where there might be a subtract. You could end up with a negative number, right? Um, so let's say, um, I'll just go down here again. So let's say you ended up with a result of negative, let's make it easier on myself, negative three, for example, right? So, I mean, that's not how it would look here. So you need to encode that using the, um, the, the, the integer format, okay? So we're using, um, you, in, in a previous class, you probably should have brought across, I know we teach it, um, you know, one's complement or two's complement um, encoding, right? So in, in a real computer, to represent negative numbers, we'd probably be using two encoding. In fact, we do. So Intel chips use, uh, sorry, two's complement um, to represent negative integers. Um, but our hypothetical machine is using a simpler format, just um, sign magnitude format. So the, the first bit um, is gonna be zero, if it's a negative number, one or zero if it's a positive number, and, and one to represent a negative number. And then we've got other the other 15 bits. So, so that's the sign. We've got 15 bits then to represent a magnitude, right? So if it's negative three, uh, we should have a one here for the sign bit, and then the magnitude should be the binary bit pattern to represent a magnitude of three. Very negative three. Okay. Now I always have people, um, so so um, negative three. Um, in, bi in binary, so, so we're using a 16-bit architecture here for the hypothetical machine. So that means you have to figure out what the 16 bits are. So again, I'm expecting you to know how to convert from binary to hexadecimal to decimal um, at this stage, taking a class like this. So, so for a, a negative signed number, the very first most significant bit should be a one, right? Um, and then, you know, we've got 16 bits. So we can have enough room here. Um, so you're going to have all zeros for the other 15 bits, except for the bits to represent three. Um, so that's uh, uh, two to the one, which is two plus two to the zero. Um, so that gives you a three, right? So that's your binary to represent the side magnitude for a negative three, right? So what, what is that in hexadecimal? So, so you're really supposed to give me the hexadecimal. Anybody know their hexadecimal conversion? Uh, 
each, uh, you know, as a hint, each four bits actually directly convert to one hexadecimal digit. So you should be able to tell me the, the, the three digits, the last three digits are what? What's, the, what's this digit gonna be here? Zero. Oops. I'll do it up above it here. So the last three digits are zero, zero, and then three. So this is three. So what's the first digit? What's one zero 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 binary? Eight. Yeah. So that's you know one is two to the three or eight. Two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two, two to the three. Right. So that's the actual hexadecimal of negative three. For sign magnitude, right? So for one's complement, um, I can't remember. I, I think I think for one's complement, you like you 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 um you subtract one. Oh no, for one's complement, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to try to remember. You can look it up if you can't remember. So, um, all right. Yeah, I think that's all I can think of. Any any other questions on the Problem set. All right, I'll move on then. Um, so yeah, I thought I'd, I would kind of um, get started, get you guys started on the first program assignment, right? So like I said, um, I'm gonna leave at least 15 minutes here, maybe even a half an hour. So I might stop at 11.30, 11.45 here and see if anybody here locally or, or you know if, if you're on zoom you can um chat with me as well i can i can work with you on zoom um today um to get your dev boxes up uh but let me sh let, let, let's talk about the, the first program assignment so for the first assignment um we're going to be implementing in code a simulation of this hypothetical machine so um i've got my dev box already running so you should normally, but low, you might not be able to see that. Um, uh, use Vagrant up to um, start it up, right? So, so always make certain that you're cleanly shutting down. Um, so if you've got a, a, a dev box running, um, the, you know it's, it's best not to just shut off your computer. You know, go to the directory, do a Vagrant halt, then shut off your computer when you're done working for the day. I think I mentioned this before. Once you get your dev box up, you don't have it up yet. Um, and then Vagrant up should bring up your uh, dev box for the class. So this is running a virtual machine, uh, which is running a version of Linux. Um, so I mentioned last time, I'm probably gonna have some other activities for us to do on Linux, um, or at least I'll give some examples and stuff of operating system, how, how Linux operating system does things like, like manage processes or memory or things like that. Um, so, you know, some things to look at, you know, of course, see whether you're getting any error messages or not. Uh, check that your port 8080 is shown being forwarded. Um, if that's not being forwarded, you won't be able to open up your Visual Studio Code browser and get to the, um, the uh, simulations for the class. Um, and you will need to make certain that your shared folders are being mounted. Okay, so what this means, you'll see something. So here, uh, we're mounting in the... Uh, the, the, the virtual machine, dev box, the directory home vagrant sync, that's, the, that, that's being mounted on my host machine to this directory, right? So if you're a Windows user, uh, where it's mounted to will be the place where you did your Git clone. So like on Windows, this will be something like C colon users, your username, um, then repos, and then the CSCI 430 OS Sims if you um, cloned it where I suggested you do it too. So. On Mac, it, it's 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 not home. It's like what slash users and then slash username or something like that. So, um, um, I think I showed that before, so I'll show that again. Um, um, so we'll go over doing a make submit again. Repeat that here. I think I did show that last time too. So if it's running though, um, you should be able to open up a browser. Um, to that port, okay? I had somebody run into a problem. Uh, it's not actually being served on HTTPS.
and do HTTPS instead of HTTP. HTTPS is what? That's HTTP over a secure socket layer, secure socket layer, I believe, something like that. So it's basically an encrypted connection. So the raw HTTP goes over encryption so that people in the middle can't see you typing in your password to a web form or something like that, right? But, you know, the, the Visual Studio Code server doesn't run on, um, doesn't have a secure socket uh, set up. So if, if, you, if you try and do that, um, you'll get a, some kind of an error message about it failing, depending on your browser. So, so you do, so if you just type in 127.00.1, it might default to trying HTTPS, which is what I think this student was running into, couldn't figure it out. So, so you, you might have to explicitly say HTTP. So I, I want plain HTTP, not, not encrypted, um, to, to communicate with my Visual Studio Code browser that's running on that port. So 127.0.0.1. So that's just a special IP address that always maps to your machine. If you ever take a class on networking or something like that. So that's one of the things you talk about. Um, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna configure this a little bit. I usually like Nowadays, I, I've gotten partial to um, uh, dark themes. Let's, let's change over to a dark theme here. Although maybe I shouldn't. It might be not as visible. Eh, believe it. Um, so to work on the assignments, um, what you want to do, you want to start by um, opening the, the folder for the assignment you want to work on. Right. So, so you do need to open up. You, you can't open it up at the, the top level. You have to open up the um, particular um assignment that you want to work on so so that should be on your um sync assignments and so in this case we're going to start working on assignment one okay so yeah when you do open folder um you have to, to navigate to it but but yeah don't open up like at the assignment you know the, the level above all the assignments so, so in order to build everything correctly you have to uh, open up on sync assignment one or if i can make that bigger there we go a little better. Um, so, when you open up your assignment, um, um, there's there's a um, this is an example of a, a typical example of a project. So there's subdirectories that hold um things like data files for the simulations um and other directories and things so it should be configured uh to um um yeah, so, so there should be particular configurations so that we've got the build system set up for you so i'll show that to you um let, let, let's look at the description for the assignment. So there's, there's several ways that you can read the description. So um, you can just look in the markdown file here. Um, so that actually has, this is actually kind of like the, the, the readme for the assignment. Well, you know, so, so this is the, this is the assignment description in the assignment.md file. This is using um, a, a markup language, if you, if you know what that is. So it's like HTML is a markup language. Uh, markdown is becoming very common for software developers. It's a good kind of thing to learn. So it's a simplified markup language. So it uses things like single pound to represent a level one heading, um, double pound for a level two heading. You know, so, you know, you can get the same thing by doing HTML and having HTML tags. Uh, uses double stars to bold things, uh, use, just use dashes to create bolded lists, so on, right? Uh, but of course, this is raw markdown. Um, you can render this if you want to. So if you right click on this, so yeah, this, this is perfectly readable, um, but, um, but if you render it, you'll see it a bit better. Um, so if you right click and um, uh, open preview or control shift V, um, you should be able to get a rendered version of it, right? 
Um, there is also a PDF file. Um, you won't be able to, to watch, you won't be able to, to read that in Visual Studio Code because as far as I can tell, there's no real good PDF viewer available in PDF uh, in, in Visual Studio Code, like an extension or something. So, um, but uh, again, th these files are being shared you know, mounted on your host machine. So you could always open up a browser on your host machine um, and, and find the directory where you created that repository, look in your assignment, assignment one, and then open up your PDF on, on your host machine, however you normally view like a PDF file. And okay. that's how you get to the um, assignment instructions. Um, all right, so a little background on this. Um, first assignment, so I already mentioned, uh, we're, we're building a simulator for the hypothetical machine, right? So you basically are given input files that use the same, well, um, I probably don't have any, use some of the same opcodes that you have to do for the written problem set that, for, that you're working on for Friday, all right? Um, so let's look at one of those input files real quickly here. So, um, so all the input files are in the sim files here. So we can look at like program one.sim. Right? So for example, if we run the, the, the first simulation, once the, your simulator is working, um, basically it's, th this is the initial contents of the registers and the memory, and this is actually the, the same as the first, as the example in our textbook, um, if you're using the same edition um, that I'm, I'm using. So. so we start with the program counter, it has a value of 300. So it's gonna start ex fetching and executing from memory address 300. The accumulator has a value of zero. And then um, th this is part of the simulator. We, we specified that the simulator is supposed to simulate a memory that has a base address of 300 um, and a bounds address or a last address of 1,000. Okay, so those are the valid memory addresses that the simulator is going to um, allow when we do the simulation. And then after that are the contents of memory. Um, so, you know, you can, you can have contents uh, poked into memory anywhere here. So we've got, you know, a value 1940 at memory address 300. So a one is like a load, I believe. I remember right, and then the 940 means we're loading the value from memory address 940 into the accumulator, right? Um, and these are some more values in memory. So that, that, that's what the um, these inputs look like. Um, So one good thing to do is when, when you first um, start one of these assignments, make certain that everything is configured correctly and you can compile and run the tests. All right. So, so the first step, once you um, um, open up um, the project like I did, close off some of these, is um, let's open up the, the file with the, the tests in here. Right. So there should be some key sh keyboard shortcuts um, um, defined for you. That's part of the configuration that's, that's set up for your dev box for using Visual Studio Code. So control shift one should do a make clean, right? So um, all, all these, uh, we're using a, a tool called make for um, implementing the, the build system for all the assignments here. So basically this is a tool that, that helps you uh, organize and, and build separate um, source files into an executable. Um, it can also do other tasks, you know, so we use it to run our tests and to make documentation and to make the submission file and other things. Um, you can run these things by hand. So if, if the keyboard shortcuts aren't working, so if you try control shift one and it doesn't do a make clean, um, you ought to try opening up a terminal. So if you go to file, um, um, uh, oh, terminal, if you go to terminal, do new, new terminal. Uh, this opens up a terminal that's running on your um, um, 
inside of your uh, dev box. Okay, so it's running on your your virtual machine, right? Uh, and, and at the moment, I'm in my assignment one directory, the, the, the project that we have open. So it, it, it sets that as my current directory. Right? That's where you want to be. So, so um, you know, you can do these by hand from the command line, but the keyboard shortcuts are just invoking the make system as if you were typing these commands on the command line. So, so we could do the make clean here. That just deletes all of the kind of... Um, the temporary product files that are used to build the final executables for the assignment. So you can so you can make certain that you have a clean build, uh, start from scratch, make certain everything's um, building correctly. Um, if you want to, you can do make help. This will give you a list of all the targets uh, that you can do on on our build system here. All right. So so the ones that have keyboard short but Shortcuts are just the the, the make clean um, to, to so we can do a clean build. Uh, the make uh, so Control Shift Two will do a make all uh, by default. Um, the the first target, the default target, all um, if if you don't specify a target to make, it will do that first target, which is which is a make all in our case, which which means build everything for the assignment, right? So if you do a make, so, so make or make all are equivalent. So if you don't specify a target, it defaults to doing make all, building everything. So again, you can get the same thing, but control shift two should be bound to the key, uh, keyboard shortcut that will do a make all, right? So one thing about a build system is it only rebuilds the things that need to be rebuilt. So notice that nothing needed to be done because I had just built it uh, in my terminal, right? So if, if I were to make an edit, so let, let's say, let me just add a space um, to my test here. So now I've actually modified this file. Now, if I did a build, it'll only rebuild the things that, that are out of date, that need to be rebuilt. So it should only rebuild the assignment one tests, but then I'll have to link together things again. So, so let's try that. So control shift two, uh, we'll see that it, it's only building the assignment one tests. So it starts by building the assignment one tests. That was the only thing out of date, but assignment one tests is used in the test executable. So it relinks the test executable together. So, so it's linking together the assignment one test object file and the hypothetical machine simulator object file to, to create our test executable. Yeah, we'll talk more about that in a second here. So. Let me do a full build again here. Just to mention a few things. So, you know, it's good to understand what's happening for these builds here. So, so we're using C++ in this class, uh, which is a compiled language, okay? So, you know, if you haven't done a lot of stuff with a multi-file project, it's typical to compile a project with multiple source files. So we individually compile each source file into what's known as an object file. So an object file can't be run, it can't be executed as a program, but, but it is like an initial compilation just of the code in that module or, or that that uh, that source file, right? So so we start off when you do a full build by creating the object files from all the .cpp source files that we have. So so we build test.cpp to make the test.object.o is the object file. Um, we've got a, a, a source file called hypothetical machine simulator.cpp, which is where you're going to be doing most of your coding for this assignment one. You're going to be adding all your code into the hypothetical machine simulator.cpp. Um, so we compile that into an object file uh, here. And then after that, so, so these are actually just compiling the object files and then we're, we're linking, okay? So actually G++ can do both compilation and it can also link object files into a final executable. It's really doing two different things here. Um, so, so compiling to object files is compilation. Uh, and then this is really a linking stage if you know anything about a compiled language like this. Um, so anyway, like, like here, uh, we actually build two executables. We build a, a set of tests, and that's what you're going to be using mostly to work on the assignments for this class, this test executable. So the test executable, in this case, we're linking together the assignment one tests and the hypothetical machine object file. Um, and we're, we're linking in another object file, this um, simulator exception object file. So we, we link together those three object files to create the test executable. Um, 
And then actually we compile one more file. There's assignment one sim. Um, so our, our ultimate goal for all these assignments in this class is to actually build a simulation of some, some part of an operating system. Okay. So actually for our first week here, it's not really part of an operating system. It's a simulation of a basic hypothetical computing system. So we're not simulating an operating system component, but an, uh, um, an actual machine. Right? So um, our other simulators I already mentioned, so we'll, 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 we'll build a simulation of a paging system. We'll build a simulation of a process scheduler. We'll build a simulation of a, um, of a, um, um, a deadlock detection uh, mechanism that some operating systems use, things like that. Um, so anyway, uh, but, but yeah, so this last one also builds the simulator um, and then it links together and you know, we're reusing the hypothetical machine simulator object file and these exceptions, but in linking in the, the simulation object file to create the final simulator. Okay. So I'll show you using that here in a second or, uh, today as well. So. All right, let's get back to the, the nuts and bolts. I mean, that, that's all stuff that would be useful for you to know to understand what's going on here, right? You know, you know, to be able to detect whether we're cleanly building. So, you know, you should you should at least be able to see whether it cleanly built. So it cleanly builds if you see these things create the, um, you know, compile the objects and link together um, the executables. And you should get a message that the terminal will be, be reused if the compilation succeeded, right? If it didn't succeed, you're going to get some sort of an error message. You might get some list of problems here. Um, in, in the problems in Visual Studio Code. Um, and you might also get some, sometimes you, you got problems that aren't compilation problems, but, but other kinds of errors, like maybe link errors. So in that case, you might not be able to detect it. The, the, uh, the C++ IntelliSense might not be able to detect it, but it might not be able to link together, in which case you'll get some sort of an error message about you know, linking, missing something or something like that. Um, So I described a little bit of that, the stuff in the assignment description. So let, let's let's um, uh, let me just get you started on the um, assignment. Okay. So so basically, these, these assignments, I, I give you a set of tasks, and you should do these in order. And the the task form um, are, are always like this. So the first one you have to do is implement. Most all the tasks are going to be implementing some function that's part of the the simulator object, the simulator class for that assignment. Okay. So the first task for the first assignment is we want to implement the initialize memory function, or you're supposed to implement it, right? So um, if you look in the test file first, you'll notice that we create one of these hypothetical machine simulator. Uh, we create, create an instance of that object, right? And then, then we're using it to, to test uh, that you implement the things that we asked ask for. So the very first test case should be testing initialized memory, okay? So what initialized memory is supposed to do is we're supposed to give that base and bounds address that's gonna be coming ultimately from the simulation input file. And we need to initialize the, 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 an array that we're gonna to use to simulate the memory for our hypothetical machine, right? So, um, so after we initialize memory, you know, uh, there, there's some getter methods like, you know, the, the base address should be 300. If we initialize it with the base address 300, the bounds address should be 1,000. The size of memory is the difference between the end and the begin. So with those bound, base and bounds address, we've got a size of memory of 700, for example. Um, so, all code in C and C++ is, is usually split between a header file. So since we're using C++, we use .hpp for the header file extension, okay? So in the header file only goes the declarations of things. So you don't have the implementation of code in header files, of, of, of functions and things. You just declare things. So declare the signatures of your functions, declare, um, and so we, we declare a bunch of stuff in the header file, some, some useful enumerated types, 
that I might talk about, but, but the main one is we declare a class. Uh, so for all the assignments, there's gonna be a class usually that's the main thing for the simulation. So in this case, you know, we're, we're using C++ and object-oriented programming. We, we've got a class called hypothetical machine. It has a bunch of private member variables, right? It, it uses that to run the simulation. And you have to use these variables in some of the implementations that you do for the first assignment here, um, including, um, we're using an array. So for initialized memory, we actually have to initialize this array called memory and the memory bounds address and the memory base address, right? And memory size here. So, so you might not, you know, again, depends on how much C or C++ you've done. Um, uh, we declare this to be a pointer to an integer, but we can use that to dynamically allocate an array of memory, right? And then after that, we can treat this as an array. So you might be, if you haven't done a lot of stuff with pointers or dynamic memory allocation, um, after we dynamically allocate this, then it's just gonna be an array. And, you know, and, and we could do things like memory at address zero equals um, 1940, if we're pushing instruction 1940 into that location of our simulated memory, that kind of thing. All right, um, and then the, 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 we'll have a bunch of public declarations, usually of the member functions. Um, and for all the, the assignments for this class, you know, I've already given you the declaration of the function. You just have to implement the body usually, okay? So in this case, you know, we, we've already given the declaration of initialized memory. Um, it's a void function, so it doesn't return anything. It's a void member function. It's a member of the um, hypothetical machine simulator class. Um, and it takes two parameters as input, the base address and the bounds address, right? And the purpose of it then is it needs to initialize a couple of things. So if you call it with the base address and the bounds address, um, it needs to initialize the base address, the bounds address, it needs to initialize the memory size, and it also needs to initialize the simulated memory. And actually it needs to dynamically allocate that, that memory. So, um, so in fact, for this first assignment, I don't think you're actually even gonna, gonna be making any changes in the header file. Um, you will be making changes in the, uh, I better check, it looks like I got um, an old student file in here. Let me, um, uh, that might already have some implementations. Let me, let me um, do something real quickly here. I'm just going to throw away those changes and get back to the starting of the assignment like you guys should have it. So, um, Um, to restore these all. So all I'm doing here is I'm just throwing away the stuff I've got locally and I'll get it back to what you guys should be starting with here. There we go, that should be better. There we go. Okay, so I'm back to a clean state now. So um, while I'm thinking about it, uh, do do change both in the header file. So so before you submit your code, um, put your uh, name. If you're working on a group, um, put all your group members um, and 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 put them alphabetically by last name. That will help the auto grader detect groups correctly. So. Um, So, so alphabetically, so just put them all on the, the author. Uh, if you are working on a group, you know, um, I mean, I, I, I notice a lot of people, a lot of students are kind of cavalier 
with their CWID, you really shouldn't be giving that out to other people, right? So you don't have to, to include your CWID, even if you're an individual, if you don't want to, um, but, uh, but definitely for, not for a group, maybe make certain the rest of the stuff is updated as well. So. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd kind of like you to do that both for the header file for the main simulation and the, um, the CPP file as well. Um, all right, let's look at initialized memory. I had, um, um, I, I like this feature of this outline that uh, Visual Studio Code has. So instead of like scrolling through or searching through here, um, although my, I got my text a little bit pretty big, but bigger, uh, not, not really. So not without not being able to use it. So about as big as I can get it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I like the outline here um, because then, you know, instead of scrolling around, I can directly find the, uh, the, the functions that we want to, um, uh, to, to get to. So in this case, initialized memory. So. Um, all right, so the normal way that you work on these assignments is, um, um, so for example, I, I suggest that you go through the test one by one, okay? So the very first test, that happens. So, so this checks, th this calls another member function, get memory base address. So we can look at that one. So the, um, uh, see if we can find it, get memory base address, right? So that just returns the member variable member memory base address, right? And that is going to be, if you look in the constructor, uh, oh, the constructor calls reset. So if you look in reset, um, it probably sets the memory base address and all those to zero, right? So if, you, if, if we don't do anything to change the memory base address, whenever we create um, an instance of a simulation, the memory base address is gonna be zero, right? So, so if we're not changing that, if, if we ask to get what the memory base address is gonna return zero and that this, this test is gonna fail because after we initialize memory to have a base address of 300, we expect it to return 300 for the memory base address, right? So, you know, all that is, is a long winded way of saying that what we need to do to pass that first test is um, go back to initialized memory. Um, oh, in this case, uh, this is something I know that trips up student, uh, students that um, are not as familiar with C or C++, but um, for C++, uh, you can have the name of a parameter be the same as the name of a member variable, but there's a conflict there. So I've got a member variable called memory base address, which is exactly the same as the parameter that I'm passing in. So within the scope of this member function, I've actually got two variables called memory base address. So one is the class member variable and one is the parameter that's local to this function. Okay? So if that confuses you, um, I mean, it, it's fine to just say that my parameter is called init memory base address and my, um, my uh, function uh, member variable is, is called memory base address. You shouldn't, shouldn't change the name of these variables uh, for the member variables, but, but it is fine to change the inside these parameters, uh, inside these member functions, the, the parameter name. So. so you could do that. So whatever we, we pass in to initialize the memory base address, we're going to assign that value to the, be the, the member variables memory, memory base address for our simulation. All right? If you have questions, you know. So, uh, and I encourage you to, to practice incremental development. So don't, don't like try and write the whole function and then see if it compiles, you know. So add one line of code, make certain it's still compiling. So let's... Um, Let's uh, control shift two, see if it compiles. So it still compiled cleanly, didn't have any errors when we compiled there. And then control shift three, let's run the tests. So I, I expect, you know, unless I made an error here, if we look at our tests again, we're, we're initializing the memory base address. So I should at least be passing the test, the first test now on line 31. So I've finally done something to implement something here. 
right? and I'm giving you some of the first tasks that you have to do here, right? So, so control shift uh, three, we'll run our tests. Uh, hint, so when you run these tests, uh, you should always go up to the, the very top. So scroll all the way back up and look at the first failing test, right? So um, really, you want to concentrate on the first test that's failing and, and getting that to pass. So don't don't be looking at the last failing test or things like that. Always always start from the first failing one and and, and go from there. That's also part of incremental development here. So the first failing test is on line thirty two, which is what I expected because we're not failing the check on line thirty one. We we are correctly setting the memory base address and returning that. And so we pass the test. We, we initialize the base address to be 300. We expect if we query it, that it's 300 now, right? So these kinds of setter methods and getter methods are very common in object-oriented program. Again, you know, even if you haven't done C++, I expect at some point that, that you, you, you run across the concept of, of object-oriented program. So, the idea of encapsulating uh, data and functionality in a class, um, the idea of the, yeah, I mean, you know, member functions. So, so being able to, you know, not being able to directly modify the data of the class. So in order to, you know, so classes normally hide the data that's encapsulated inside the class. So you don't want to let, you don't want to have it so that I can directly set the memory address of the SIM. I need to have methods that I invoke in order to, um, set the, the state for my hypothetical machine simulator object, which is what we're doing here, like with initialized memory. Um, now we can do we can do the I, I'll, I'll do the other three here. So uh, the other three easy one. Oh, um, back to this. Uh, so it, it's more common for experienced C plus plus programmers or or uh, code that you'll see that they use the same name, uh, but they dis, just disambiguate it. So my solution will probably look more like this. Okay. So here, there, there's a special pointer um, in C++ classes called this, um, which refers to this object that the member function is being invoked on. So in this case, if I say this memory base address, that disambiguates. That, that means that it knows that I mean the memory base address, which is the member variable of my hypothetical machine, right? As opposed to if I don't say anything, it's going to assume that this one then refers to the parameter that's passed in. So that, that's how we disambiguate the two, the, the conflict of the name memory base address here. And this is pretty typical in, in C++ code that's doing thing, uh, uh, initialization methods, setter methods for C++ code often does this kind of stuff. Um, so we can also set our bounds address. Uh, member variable to be the parameter that's passed in for initialized memory. Now I'll compile and run my tests. Control shift two to compile. Control shift three runs the test. Move this somewhere else. So now um, I wish I've been looking for like a plugin or an extension on Visual Studio Code that can use these unit tests so you could click on these. Doesn't seem like there's a good one for, for the uh, the unit test framework we're using, unfortunately. So the only way, way you can do it is to look at the output from running the unit tests and then look at the line numbers. So in this case, the first failing test, if you scroll all the way to the top, is on line 33. So, so yeah, we go back here. So, so yeah, now we're passing the base address, the bounds address. Uh, we expect the size to be just the difference of those two. So, um, oh. Sorry, eleven fifty four. So you want to actually subtract the bounds address, which is the in address. Okay, so these are common names in memory management. They call it the base and the bounds. So I'm, I'm, we'll talk about memory management and about um, 
um, relative addressing using a base address and an offset later on in this class, which is kind of why I used this format for the simulation here. So keep that in mind when we get to talking about uh, memory management. Uh, but yeah, in this case, the memory bounds address is the higher one, so you want to subtract that. So that should be a thousand minus three hundred should give us the actual size here, right? So we'll build and run our tests again then. So here we've got a lot more passing now. So our first failing test is down to line 50. Our test here. So um, we're passing all these. We reset the simulation um, and we expect that by calling reset, it resets base and bounds and size to zero. So that was already given to you in the reset method. Um, and then we test it with another initialize, pass all these and we get all the way down here. Um, I, I am asking you to um, throw some exceptions. So, so these simulations practice a little bit of some defensive coding and programming, okay? So in this case, um, Um, I should probably be testing more of these, but but because of the way our hypothetical machine works, I don't know if I still have it open here. Yeah, I do. So we've only got 12 bits um, for an address. So that means that in hexadecimal, we can only represent addresses with three digits. So 000 to 999, right? So, um, uh, but but actually hexadecimal, um, my sim the, the simulation I gave you, I really should have allowed memory addresses from 000 to FFF, but I, I kind of um, left out converting to hexadecimal. So we're really using decimal in our simulation. So so that's why there, there's a, a, um, a an upper limit of 999 or, or 1000 for specifying an address in the simulation. That, that's the biggest address that you can specify with 12 bits. Um, where that comes out to like three hexadecimal digits, basically, right? So um, that, that's all we're testing here is that if, if you give an address of 1001, that's illegal. I should probably also be testing, um, like if you give an address, like a negative address um, or something like that, right? Um, But uh, in this case, uh, there's, there's some, you, you can just copy and paste the examples um, of, of throwing exceptions. I've got some others already existing in the code. So let, let's search for, um, an example of an exception here. Let me see if I have a better one here. So here, here's a here's a good one. So, so throwing an exception, basically all you have to do is create one of these similar exception instances and give it a message, uh, and that will throw the exception, right? So for initialized memory, we're expecting before you do any of this stuff, I, I kind of talk about these things here. Um, although maybe not everything. So um, yeah, I didn't talk about setting the base and the bounds address in the, in the meta comments here. So, you know, for example, if the memory base address less than zero um, or the memory base address greater than or equal to 1000, or if the bounds addresses are out of bounds as well. Then um, we should be throwing an exception.
you can make up your own message here. So um, um, probably um, since I've gone longer already, I want to talk a little bit about some of the other tasks here, but um, um, let's just throw a message that um, that the memory base or bounds is out of range. So anyway, that, that should, um, um, that's an example of the kinds of things. So, so for some of the other methods you also are expected to detect error conditions and throw one of these simulator exceptions the same kind of way. So, um, so let's see if that passes the test on line 50. Uh, so there's an example. It didn't compile. So I had a um, I had an error. This is a compilation error. So I can see that in my problems. I misspelled something, didn't I? So memory bounds addressed. There we go. Sometimes the IntelliSense takes a little bit of time to update. Um, you just have to kind of, so I think I did fix it. Let, let's, let's save it, build. There we go, it built better that time. So, so it, com it compiled that time and we'll run it. So, um, oh, so, so, but um, in this case, I'm doing something wrong here. So I have an unexpected exception. So I'm, I'm throwing an exception when I shouldn't. Um, so, um, um, uh, up here somewhere on like line 27, when I try, well, so, so in general, when I called initialized memory, I ended up throwing an exception in here where, when I wasn't expecting one to occur here. So um, what did I do wrong there? So Looks okay to me, but um, let's. Um, so yeah, again, you know, incremental development. So always fix if, if you are having a compilation error. Always um, go back and, and make certain that, um, or you know, if you're failing an unexpected test, like like I am here. So I just added it, so I know I had something wrong with my test conditions there. Well, I didn't immediately spot it, so I'm going to kind of back off. Let's just test for that one specific thing. So the one specific thing is supposed to be doing is because it's 1001 um, and, um, and I'll even make it exactly what it's expecting there. So if the bounds address is greater than or equal to 1001, we should go in there and throw that exception. So. Um, oh yeah, I, I think I, did I say less than or equal to zero? So zero is a valid address. Maybe that was what I did wrong. Maybe I should have just said less than zero because I, I did initialize it with a memory base address of zero sometimes. So. Better, so now we get all the way to line 66. So it is throwing this exception. So let me get, um, um, try that again then. Just with the bounds address. So if the memory bounds address is, um, less than zero, less strictly less than zero, so negative, or it's greater than or equal to 1,001. Then, then that's better. So we're still, now we're still passing all the tests all the way down to line 66. So, so I, sh I should probably add in also for the memory base address, the same thing there, so.
Okay, there we go. That's better. So there's one more thing on initialized memory. Um, you do have to um, um, you have to actually allocate the memory and um, uh, allocate a new array dynamically. Um, and, 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 and ensure that it's initialized all to zero. Okay. Again, uh, if you look through this code here, um, I don't know if there's an example of, of allocating it, but there's a, there's a, um, an example of of checking if it's already allocated and deleting it, um, probably in reset. So yeah, I mean, basically, if memory is non-null, then um, you can safely delete it. Um, when we're initializing memory, because that means something was dynamically allocated previously, um, and we want to get rid of that. But then, instead of um, initializing it to null, we want to dynamically allocate a new array of memory um, in initialized memory. So. Um, So uh, again, I'll, I'll, I think I'll just go ahead and, and show this. So you know, um, if you haven't done stuff with dynamic memory allocation in C, in this case, we want to create a new array of, um, of integers of the particular size. So that's what the memory size is for. All right. So so memory is supposed to be a, a pointer to an integer. And when you do a new, it returns a pointer to an integer. And, and in this format, it returns a pointer to a block of integers that can hold up to the value that, that you pass in here. So that should be like 700 in our first test here. So that's gonna give us an array of 700 values that we can use for our simulated memory here, right? And then we should initialize all that memory to zero, like, like we say in here as well. Um, the, the simulation expects that to be true. So, so we're still passing all the tests we were passing before when I added that in. So we're still, our first family test is still down to line 66. something like that to ensure that all that memory we just dynamically allocated um, up to from zero up to our memory size um, is initialized to zero. Right. All right. Um, so that, that was pretty much all for the first task there, uh, an example of doing the first task. Um, so, uh, I mean, you know, we still got next week, you know, to, to work on, on, on this stuff. So the, the next few um, are pretty similar. Um, so, you know, the, the second task is to implement the translate address member, uh, member function. So basically this takes an address in the simulated memory address space and converts that to an index to that array, okay? So, so like we just did for example, the, if the memory address is 300, the valid indexes to that array that we just dynamically allocated are, for, are actually from zero to 699, right? So if I ask for memory address 300 of the simulation, we have to translate that to the index zero of the array. Right, so that, that's what translate address is doing, peek and poke. And then ultimately uh, you're gonna be implementing um, functions like fetch, execute, and then these functions execute, load, store, jump, subtract and add uh, are gonna be called whenever the simulation is doing the, you know, is, is simulating running uh, an opcode that it finds in memory, so, all right. So yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and stop there. Um, I'll stick around if anybody wants me to look at their dev box, uh, try and get you set up. Uh, we'll talk more about the assignment one next Tuesday as well. So, all right, yeah, that's it. I'll, I'll let you guys go.
Uh, if there's any questions on the people online here, let me know. Bring up the chat. There. Yeah, there, there's an announcement about the problem with the extension. Did you do the, the steps for the announcement yet? So if people are having problems with that extension, and I think probably everybody will have problems with the extension, so make certain that you follow these steps um, um, in the, uh, the, I guess the most recent announcement, class devs, dev box setup issues. So part two, so, so we need to open up a terminal and remove cpptools.bsix and download this one instead, and then uninstall your cpptools extension and then install from this file here. So, so did you do those steps or not? No. So, so, so start by right clicking on your extension install. You're looking in installer. So you don't have install. Okay, so go ahead and open up the terminal um, and do those steps. Um, yeah, so generic message. So, uh, your Matt. So, I don't know if you want to email me. It might be a commercial issue. If you destroy the box and try to uninstall it, it's not going to uninstall it. So you got that? Yeah, yeah. I use on the stack tool. I was trying to do that. No, I didn't do this one. I just on the stack tool. Can you email me or email me again? I you know, tried to do the same with that guy, but it, it didn't happen. Um, I don't know if you can bring that up. Maybe we'll try it. And okay. What? But, yeah. So then, um, try to make it up. Okay, so far. 